Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here in Kuala Lumpur and those abroad. My name is Shazlan and I'll be your MC for today. On behalf of the organizing committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the very first Society of Petroleum Engineers Asia Pacific Virtual Town Hall. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Petronas for supporting the organization of this event and screening and to various companies such as Shell, Slumberger, Halliburton, PTTEP, Baker Hughes, and many more for hosting our virtual audiences around the Asia Pacific region. Today, we'll be hearing two New Year addresses on the state of the industry. The first address will be by Dr. Nathan Meehan, the 2016 SPE President and Senior Executive Advisor of Baker Hughes Incorporated, who will be speaking with us from Houston, Texas. He will then be followed by Datuk Muhammad Anwar Taib, Chairman of SPE Asia Pacific Board and Senior Vice President Upstream Malaysia of Petronas. He will be speaking from the Petronas Real-Time Visualiz Visualization Center in Kuala Lumpur. This unique real-time virtual event will combine both local and remote audiences in over 25 different locations from around the Asia Pacific region to serve an expected audience of over 2,000 oil and gas professionals. To help everyone understand what to expect, I will highlight the key activities that will be taking place during the session, as well as how you can participate both prior to and during the Q&A session. At each location, a Q&A coordinator is available for you to submit your questions into the online system if your question has been entered into the system by another member of the audience, your coordinator may vote on the question to increase its popularity. We highly encourage you to submit and vote for questions to be posed during the Q&A session of this program, which will take place after we hear from both gentlemen. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for the day. Dr. Nathan Meehan, the 2016 SPE President, is the Senior Executive Advisor at Baker Hughes Incorporated, advising the executive management on reservoir and geoscience matters. He has been previously sorry, he has previously served as president of CMG Petroleum Consulting and Vice President of Engineering for Occidental Oil and Gas. Dr. Meehan has a PhD in pet petroleum engineering from Stanford University and is currently serving on the EME Industry Relations Board at Pennsylvania State, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, and the Advi Advisory Board of World Oil. He is the recipient of the Lester C. Uren Award for Distinguished Achievement in Petroleum Engineering and the De Gaulle Distinguished Service Medal and served as an SPE Distinguished Lecturer. He is also the recipient of the SPE 2014 Public Service Award. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Meehan to provide us with some insights on the state of the global industry and SPE and its plans for 2016. Over to you, Dr. Meehan. Well, good morning. I hope this is all working out very well. I'm looking forward to this virtual town hall meeting. I want to see how this event unfolds. I'm also looking forward to seeing how the final game of the U.S. College Football Championship unfolds. It's playing right now. And my being here is proof of just how important I think SPE members are in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I'm also looking forward to returning as often as I can to your region. Uh, I'll be there for OTC Asia and several more times throughout my presidency. Finally, I'd like to give a shout out to my section, which is the South China section in Sheko. Uh, I hope they put my name in for the prize draw. Uh, this event is only gonna be a success if we can make it a two-way conversation and have your contributions. Now, I'm grateful for the foresight of Dr. Ganwar, uh, who envisioned this and the contributions of the SB staff and employees of Petronas and Baker Hughes behind the scenes to make all the technology work. I want to thank our generous sponsors as well. If we have a good experience here, I think we can look forward to more such events. Specifically, I'm hoping that it paves the way 
for us to connect industry and technology leaders globally in a new way to support SPE's mission, which of course is to collect, disseminate, and exchange technical knowledge concerning the exploration, development, and production of oil and gas resources and related technologies for the public benefit and to provide opportunities for professionals to enhance their technical and professional competence. Some of you know that the phrase I emphasized for the public benefit is one that is dear to me. So tonight here in Houston and whatever time it is where you are, I'm going to start off our discussion with a, covering a little bit about how the global environment has changed and what I think the immediate future holds. I want to reiterate why our efforts are so important and so critical and discuss a few of the challenges ahead, including one I call the elephant in the room. I'm sure Dr. Anwar will then bring the discussion much more in focus for the Asia Pacific region before we both try to answer some of your questions. And before I get started, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge the recent passing of Dan Adamson, a former CEO of our society. He was a great man and a good friend. He dedicated his life work to the society. Under his leadership, we grew from a relatively small North American organization to a truly global one. He is Mark Rubin's predecessor. I suppose not that many of you had the privilege of knowing him. One thing that the public sees related to our industry is gasoline prices. And besides taxes, of course, crude oil prices are the number one thing that contribute to gasoline prices. But it's crude oil prices that we pay attention to. Now, as SBE members, I suppose we follow those prices much more than almost any other professional society. And I started following them when I was a student as an undergraduate college. When I started college, oil prices were $3 a barrel. Same price they were when I was born. However, the OPEC, and well, initially the OAPEC, and then the OPEC embargoes in the 70s changed everything. Prices escalated, and we had what I like to call the first great oil and gas boom. Oil prices that had been $3 exploded to $40, and we thought we were in oil man's heaven. Drilling activity also exploded. You have to realize that rig activity in North America was below 1,000 as recently as 1973. The most widely known measure of oil and gas activity, of course, is the Baker Hughes rig count, which dates to 1947. In the period of time from that first embargo, we, we went from 1,000 North American drilling rigs to peak at more than 4,500 by December 26 of 1981. Enrollments in petroleum engineering programs around the world grew rapidly. Oil and gas activity jumped in every corner of the world. Oil man's heaven ended all too quickly. Higher prices prompted increased exploration, development activity, and substantially increased supply. It also made conservation and efficiency investments in traffic. OPEC volumes increased substantially and oil prices dropped to $20 or lower for more than six years. The last five to six years of the 1980s and the early years of the 1900s was the opposite of oil man's heaven for many, as the companies laid off massive numbers of people. North American rig activity would again drop below 1,000 and stay at levels between 750 to 1,000 until the real recovery started in September of 2002, 1985 to 2002. Hiring dropped dramatically as capital budgets were slashed. By 1990, there would only be a handful of petroleum engineers graduating. U.S. oil production declined sharply. You might think that the late 1980s was like that 1987 REM hit. It's the end of the world as we know it. But it wasn't the end of the world. Oil and gas prices were down, but activity levels were like a thousand rigs, not zero. During this time, innovation wasn't nice to have. It was essential for survival. During this time period, we commercialized horizontal drilling. We invented geosteering and made MWD and LWD practical. 
I was an SBE Distinguished Lecturer in 1991 and traveled around the world talking about horizontal wells. Everybody was excited about implementing this new technology in spite of the fact that oil was $20 a barrel. SAG-D became a useful tool instead of a theory. Advances in computation made new generations of modeling routine, practical tools, as opposed to what they were before that, which was science projects. Many deep water advances occurred, pushing TLP capabilities much further and forming the ideas for the SPAR platforms that would become the basis of the new ultra deep water development. It wasn't oil man's heaven during the 1980s and the 1990s worked that much better, but technology advances were surprisingly rapid. Companies were open to collaboration and much more so than they had been a few years earlier increased gas prices began to stir tight gas drilling in North America. Brent crude oil prices had been as low as $16.50 in November 2001. However, increased global demand, especially in China, supply instabilities, and many other factors led to oil prices climbing. By February 2002, they were still $20 a barrel, but six years later, it would be more than $100, heading to $143.95 in July of 2008. We thought things were going to be great again and oil mats heaven had returned, but the Asian financial crisis led to a crash, and by December of 2008, Brent crude would sell for less than $35. That's a drop of 76% in five months. But in this case, the spike down would be followed by a spike up. And in barely a year, oil would be back above $80. By February 2011, Brent crude oil prices would be above $1,000 and not go below that number until September 2014. That three and a half years was oil man's heaven again. It was back and it would stay for three and a half years. The new oil man's heaven was accompanied by massive unconventional activity in North America, a wave of increases in activities globally, petroleum engineering departments springing up everywhere, massive increases in enrollment, massive hiring, everything seemed like it was good. We all remember, though, the last year and a half. Oil prices have dropped 70% in 18 months. I get, wish I could say that they were done dropping. Today's West Texas Intermediate crude oil price dropped to $32 a barrel. We do not know when they will head up. Will this be a crash like the late 80s in which oil prices stay low for many, many years? Or will we recover more rapidly? It is impossible to know that. Since the year 2000 though, Global drilling activity grew steadily all around the world. Major projects were approved and implemented. The price collapse affected some areas more than others. From the peak drilling activities we saw about two years ago, Europe, Asia, Pacific, Latin America, and Africa have dropped 25 to 40%. Middle East activity is down only 2% with several countries at historically high drill level. The country that's dropped the most is Canada. It's always the most cyclical country because of winter activities, and their peak activity is normally right about now. But now Canada is off 78% from its peak activity. The U.S. is off 65%. Globally, we are operating at only half the number of rigs we were two years ago. It is a sad state of affairs. However, I doubt that it's going to rebound like the spike in 2008. Oil productive capacity in the United States is at least 4.5 million barrels a day above where it would have been without the massive additions due to unconventionals. Deep water discoveries in the Gulf of Mexico and offshore Brazil and around Australia and, and Asia Pacific are not going to be undiscovered. They're going to be developed and come on production. Chinese demand is simply not growing at the rate it was five to 10 years ago. OPEC production is at record levels. Russian production is up. 
I'm not sure what the future of Iran is. However, they promise more, not less capacity additions. So is this the end of the world as we know it? I don't think so. But I do believe that we'll be forced to innovate in ways that we could not in the 1980s. Advances in nanotechnology, big data, computing, reservoir description, and many other areas offer us solutions and tools that we must use to be successful no matter what the price of oil is. And why, why do we have to succeed? It's because oil and gas are so essential to the quality of life. Every measure of quality of life correlates to energy usage. These measures include child mortality rate, literacy, access to clean water, education, life expectancies. Companies with high per capita, countries with high per capita energy use, use high values of energy and these measures and, and let me say that again, countries that use a lot of energy have high values of all those measures of quality of life. Countries with low values are those with low energy per capita use. Now, my wife and I lived in Hong Kong for a year and a half. We coordinated our church's humanitarian efforts across Asia. We traveled to do projects including providing wheelchairs, uh, funding sanitation and water projects, vision care, neonatal resuscitation, and self-reliance projects. During this time, I saw problems through the eyes of a petroleum engineer. I saw how crucial access to safe, affordable energy was. I saw how it truly improves people's lives. Now, less than two years ago, the World Health Organization identified air pollution as the number one source of premature deaths in the world. Now, the majority of these pollution deaths were not due to ambient or outdoor air pollution. They were due to household air pollution. More than three billion people use coal or crop and animal waste to warm their homes and to cook with. Pneumonia from household air pollution causes more than 50% of the deaths of all children under age five, more than malaria, dysentery, and AIDS combined. Reliance on such primitive fuels impacts women and children disproportionately as they miss education and work opportunities and are exposed to various risks gathering fuels and they spend more time in the home exposed to smoke and burning hazards. My wife and youngest daughter just returned from volunteer efforts in Guatemala, where they built improved stoves in remote villages. Each home previously cooked on large, inefficient stoves in their homes. Sometimes it wasn't stoves, they just lit logs there on some bricks. They told me they couldn't breathe in those homes or even see 10 feet away. Now, the new stoves they installed were better vented, more efficient, started quicker. They used less wood, but they still burned wood. Globally, the demand for energy is going to rise and rise substantially. And I believe it's critical for it to rise for the quality of life to improve around the world. A Russian poet wrote a story in which there's a very inquisitive man who goes to a museum and he notices almost every small detail except for one thing. There is an elephant in the room, which he fails to notice. So this phrase in English means something that's big, present, and obvious, but not being discussed. We have an elephant in the room. It's climate change and global warming. The rest of the world is talking about this, and, and we don't do it so often. I'm not going to talk about facts and figures I'm not going to talk a, take a position on carbon pricing or even summarize the points of view of the various parties. SPE is not the Society of Climatology Engineers or experts in meteorology, but we are an important part of the energy future of the world. And I am certain that oil and gas will remain a vital part of the world's energy future. But we have to realize that this position may be at risk. Global to opposition to CO2 emissions could ultimately pose an existential threat to our industry. Now, natural gas is an obvious benefit for CO2 emissions in that it can displace coal for electricity generation and result in half or less the CO2 uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. 
Many countries with growing populations rely heavily on coal. China has radically increased domestic coal consumptions and corresponding CO2 emissions. In an effort to improve quality of life, India and Pakistan continue to dramatically expand coal usage. India's domestic coal is not the cleanest coal in the world, and many low-tech facilities there burn coal inefficiently. I recently rode a train from Kolkata to Dhanbad to visit students at the historic Indian School of Mines. I loved my visit there, but I was amazed at the dense pollution and constant burning of coal all across the countryside. India and Pakistan combined to have nine of the 10 most polluted cities based on PM 2.5, which is a specific measure related to particulates. What a challenge they face. How do you raise the quality of life for billions of people, yet reduce the environmental impact from the energy you use? Well, using cleaner oil and gas is one potential solution. Even Germany is building new coal-fired electric gener electrical generating capacity to offset nuclear capacity they're taking offline. Coal use in China is only going to slow its rate of growth in the immediate years to come. If we believe that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is worthwhile, we have to look realistically at what we might do. Obviously, increasing the use of renewables that don't emit CO2, including solar and wind, could make some impact. But even the most aggressive forecasts of growth in these variables don't keep up with the growth in total energy demand. Vastly expanded nuclear power, or hydroelectric, would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But I'm pretty skeptical that this would be accepted politically. CO2 emitting renewables, like biofuels, have some growth potential, but they're quite unlikely to impact the top line for many years to come. Another possibility that few proponents of actions for climate change discuss openly is reducing total energy demand by decreasing growth and improved quality of life. No countries really want to voluntary, voluntarily reduce its quality of life. There may be some more technological advances that will help, but I believe petroleum engineers are going to be part of the solution. We can do a lot of important things, and I'll mention just a few of them. We can reduce or eliminate fugitive emissions of methane. Methane's impact as a greenhouse gas is substantially greater on an equivalent mass basis than is CO2. No one wants to vent methane. Eliminating leaks and upsets is just good business. I kind of foresee a day when drones and other technology monitor oil fields for just such a port so that we don't vent uh, excess methane. We should reduce or eliminate flaring. Flaring should be brief, infrequent, and efficient. We should be extremely efficient in how we use energy. Well integrity should be perfect. Reservoir fluids should stay where they're supposed to stay. Produced fluids should be recovered without losses. This means long-term monitoring of well -born integrity. We must eliminate blowouts and well control incidents. This is another potential existential threat to our industry. We must become efficient in carbon capture and storage. Now, I realize many of us have looked at this in depth. Our industry offers real potential in carbon capture and storage. It's likely that when there's a solution to the carbon pricing problem, CCS projects might become commercial and even widespread. Finally, reservoir engineers have an important role. Improving recovery from existing reservoirs, lowering total capital, thereby lowering total pollutants and impact uh, required for field development, uh, minimizing the life of field WR, thereby reducing power and chemicals used for each barrel produced. Optimizing frac stimulations and well recoveries from unconventionals, which would minify, minimize surface impact and water usage. Almost everything that we can do to improve the efficiency of oil and gas recovery helps lower the carbon footprint of producing a barrel of oil or an MCFO gas. I'm asking the SPE Board of Directors 
to evaluate what our society should do to address issues raised by climate change? What should our reaction be? And I expect that that will involve some impact on our programming. A month ago, I flew in a helicopter to Saudi Aramco's giant Manifa oil field. It was a great day. It's a stunning development utilizing 26 man-made offshore islands connected by a causeway. And I'm not talking about little islands. They're big islands. And the current production is over 600,000 barrels a day with an immediate field capacity of 900,000 barrels. I walked to the edge of one of these islands and I had just returned from a resort in the Asia Pacific region. It was a very nice resort where I had gone to the water. And the water was reasonably nice. But there at the edge of these islands for this massive oil field, the transparent deep blue-green water was much cleaner than anything I had seen at the island resort. As our helicopter flew above the massive production facilities, I saw the flare stacks. And to my surprise, there was no flare at all. So I sort of assumed that the field might be shut in. However, it was producing 620,000 barrels a day. It just wasn't flaring anything. The capacity of this plant is comparable to the entire oil production in the Bakken, Eelford, or Permian Place in America. Their environmental impact and greenhouse gas emissions are much, much greater. It's clear to me that we can also improve climate change as well as environmental change generally by efficiently developing all fields, especially giant oil fields. So here's some advice for you. Go discover and develop some giant oil fields. I'm sure your boss won't mind. But our real challenge is to make our regular size fields have much lower impact per barrel and be competitive with those giant oil fields in their impact. I have a lot more I'd like to discuss, but let's pass the baton to Dato Anwar so we can keep our town hall going. Remember, what you do is important. What we do improves people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nihan. It's a very interesting address indeed. For our audience, please don't forget to submit your questions to your Q&A coordinator. Dr. Meehan has given us some things to, uh, several things to think about, and I'm sure he and Dato Anwar would be more than happy to address your questions. Continuing on with our program, I would like to take a moment to now introduce our second speaker. Dato Anwar is the chairman of the SPE Asia Pacific Board and senior vice president of Upstream Malaysia Petronas. He joined Petronas as the Vice President and CEO of Petronas Development and Production in July 2012. Dato Anwar has started, started his career in 1990 as a well-site drilling engineer. And in his 20 years of experience, Dato Anwar's assignments included drilling and completion, deep water projects, commercial evaluations, acquisition and divestment, and contracts and procom procurement in Miri, Kuala Lumpur, and New Orleans. Dato Anwar holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Case Western Reserve University in the USA, and an MBA in International Management from the RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia. Please welcome Dato Anwar. First of all, um, good morning. Uh, good evening to you, Nathan. Thank you very much for really an insightful, uh, what we call, a start of the uh, virtual town hall. Um, I would like to also thank many of you, the board members of the SPE who are around the, uh, around the region, uh, SPE members, uh, both students and professionals, and also the companies that support this uh, event today. Thank you very much for joining in. I think this is the first time we do this. Hopefully, we could actually start it, in, uh, make it into a almost a annual ritual for all of us. But what we need is actually is also feedback whether this work for all of us or not. So, Dr. Nathan, I'm trying to go and uh, clear it, uh, what we call finish it as quickly as possible, so you can still watch the 
at least the uh, prize ceremony for uh, for whomever won between uh, Clemson and uh, Alabama, I think. Yeah. Um, so it's not too late to actually uh, wish all of you Happy New Year. This is going to be a tough year. Whenever we can be happy, take it. But um, I'm just going to go and build upon what um, Dr. Me uh, Dr. Meehan has actually uh, started. He mentioned that energy is essential for all of us. And here we are in this, uh, we as the, uh, the, the industry uh, professionals, we have a role to play in this, whether it's the, uh, uh, the uh, advancement of the, tech, uh, the, uh, the industry, as well as managing the balance of bringing energy to the, to the people and making sure that we safeguard the interests of the earth in terms of climate. But I'm going to go and bring it a little bit more closer to home uh, in Asia Pacific. If many of us, many of you who have also been watching the industry, we have seen a lot of gloom in the, uh, uh, what you call in the past uh, 12, 14 months. Unfortunately, we think this will continue. In, in the many past, we could also see some of those, uh, impact, uh, those who are impacted are either the service company, uh, the uh, IOCs and the NOCs sometimes are relatively intact. But this time around, everybody is going to be impacted, especially in, oil in, in, in Asia Pacific, because in Asia Pacific, we have, uh, most of us are impacted through, not only through oil, but it's also the LNG business. The majority of actually energy trade in oil and gas, uh, in, oil, uh, in our industry in Asia Pacific are becoming heavier on LNG market. And that means it relies very much on the demand of Japan, Korea, uh, China, and potentially, um, you know, uh, India. Unfortunately, those demand, if you look at it in Japan, the nuclear power plants are starting up again. So there is, there are uncertainties in there. Uh, Korea and Japan, both of them have been successful in actually regulating their demand. Today, they are living with a much higher temperature in their offices in their, because they use less energy for air conditioning. The years of actually having, where many of us, uh, all men, we are happy because of high oil price, has been used by the consumers to actually moderate on how they can be more efficient in utilization. That drives the lower demand in the long run and afterward does impact the outcome. So for us, those are the kind of things we, we see in this, uh, in this uh, environment. And more and more, what you'll be hearing is actually it's about key to be uh, successful are going to be very much on being cost competitive, being able to maintain margin throughout the value chain. Any of the value chain or any of the partners, any of the position that cannot be able to withstand uh, what you call the, uh, the environment that we have today, most likely we have to take Another reaction, there could be a consolidation, there'll be an exit. So there are a lot of changes that we can see in this, uh, in this industry, in our industry in the, uh, in the long run, uh, in, in, in the, in the medium, medium future. So in essence, the industry, each company, whether you are NOCs, IOCs, or service companies, will have to take actions in terms of consolidation, in terms of reduction. And it's also sometimes we'll have to think about in doing so, how do we actually innovate? Um, there will be movement in terms of professionals. We are actually a significant, uh, I think in the SPE as a whole, we are actually one of the largest, if not the largest uh, single member uh, organization around the world. We have more than 140,000 members in 147 countries around the world. And we have almost 200 sections, 350 uh, university chapters around the world. And in Asia Pacific, we are also equally significant. We have 12,000 professional members. We have more than 15,000 students, uh, members, as well as 30 sections and more than 50, uh, what do you call, student chapters. So this is actually a very significant constituency for us. And for Asia Pacific, what also define Asia Pacific, uh, you know, slightly different than, uh, than the rest of the world is that the composition are a lot younger. 
And uh, so this is the, the conundrum. The future in terms of strength of the, uh, the professionals lies with Asia Pacific because of the age, uh, demography, uh, the innovation that we can generate from this kind of uh, uh, what you call excitement, uh, the potential, uh, as well as future demand and, and growth uh, in Asia Pacific. Unfortunately, at this time around, when you are relatively junior in the organization, there is a sense of powerlessness. There's a sense of inhibition. There's a sense of wanting to be assured on what we can do. So this is where in Asia Pacific, we do have to connect more. We do have to actually help one another more to go through this, uh, this challenge. While in some regions, we're talking about the big crew change where there'll be a significant amount of people going out of the industry in Asia Pacific, the challenge is actually about how do we, we actually get, uh, uh, groom, train people, develop people so that they could actually be professional very quickly. So this is a different, a different end of the, of the spectrum. Um, so the way I kind of look at it, there will be a lot of movement. In, 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 in among us. There'll be within people within the industry, professional within the industry, moving from one country to the next. Uh, mostly, if you're an expat, there will be movement back to, uh, to, uh, to, to the home countries. And if you are uh, you know, of certain age, the demography may be movement out of the industry. And I could also see there'll be a tempering down of uh, what you call recruitment uh, among the, uh, the new ones going forward. So this will require all of us to rethink, how do we make this industry sustainable? We have no doubt the long-term uh, need for energy, the long-term, uh, like what Dr. Meehan said, you know, this is about um, uh, improving lives throughout the world, is there. But we all have to survive the next three to five years in a, in a, in, in, in a good way. So. But, you know, I've been in this industry. I know that in the introduction, some, some, sometimes we forget about math. 2016 minus 1990, that's 25 years, 26 years. It's not 20 years. But anyway, that's a minor point. I've been in this industry long enough. Not as long as Dr. Meehan, but uh, we have seen the industry growing, going through the cycles. It has been, you know, if you, when I started the industry, it was $14 oil was average. $25 oil was high oil price. And throughout those years, what you see is that human ingenuity tend to actually trump all the challenge that we have. If I take some examples, we have more EOR, enhanced oil recovery production, in the 90s during the low oil price than actually today. And the strength of the deep water worldwide was built at the back of mid 80s and the 90s, where the oil price didn't even reach 40. So it's again, it's human ingenuity actually trump a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges in, in the industry. And if you can see today, it's the same. Uh, the change, the game changer is the, is the shale gas, the shale, uh, what you call the shale gas and oil in North America. And what you can see is that with this low oil price, while some venture have to shut down, many of the other ventures, they just get smarter. They got to go and figure out how to reduce their cost. So this is where the key that we have to, to think about. How could we, as professional in Asia Pacific, be smarter, be more innovative, unleash that innovation that we know it is available in many of our staff, many of our people to actually face up to this challenge? and grow through the next uh, you know, few years to ensure that we are resilient so that we can grow in the next uh, in, in the year onward. There are a few things. Uh, Nathan talked about uh, asset integrity, a lot of those. That is going to be usually the easiest thing to do, isn't it, actually not to do. What would be the easiest things to, uh, to do during uh, tough times, just like what we did in 2008 and 9? change the uh, maintenance uh, program, put a quantitative risk analysis behind it, and we'll actually sequence out a lot of those maintenance so that we can reduce costs. 
that will turn up in about four or five years' time as poor reliability and could be worse asset integrity issues, which will actually impact us when the margin has improved. So this is something that we may have to think about as leaders of the industry, as well as for many of us who are even at the lower end, at, at, the, at the much more junior position in the organization. This industry thrive in what we say in, in safety. When you see things which are not right, when you don't feel it is safe, please stand up and raise your hand and say stop. So we must do the same with asset integrity and things like that. We must do that. Um, <clears throat> this is also will require us to develop our people in a different way. If you think about the tenet of SPE, tenet of SPE is about uh, being relevant by giving, providing services through the industry, for the industry, yeah, and being, you know, uh, driving through the uh, behavior of uh, volunteerism and building network for growth. So this is our tenet. And in many cases, we have been quite successful. Think about uh, what we did with resource classification. The SPE resource classification has been accepted around the world to be the uh, one of those key uh, reference that people can use. Many jurisdictions in the world actually use that resource classification as the way, as a reference to build their, their regulation. So this is actually what we can do as an organization. I think we should take the challenge that uh, Nathan, Dr. Dr. Meehan said about, you know, what could we do in terms of repositioning ourselves with regard to climate changing, uh, challenges with climate changes. So this is what we are. Unfortunately, while we talk about volunteerism and network, the room to play is going to be reduced. We have seen in Asia Pacific, many of our events, uh, this is again, the industry are going to think about how do we survive in the next two, three years. Cost reduction, look at, uh, you know, you have to have a choice. Do I reduce this asset integrity maintenance or do I reduce costs of uh, sending people for conferences and things like that? The answer is usually quite uh, apparent. We'll take, we'll, we'll do the asset integrity over the others. So that means we have to think, and we can see it, the attendance in many of our recent uh, conferences have reduced 20 to 30 percent. We have also have to reduce the number of conferences so that we're going to focus whenever we deliver something, it means something. It must be meaningful, it must be of high quality. We would rather have that so that when people go and say, look, of all the training, of all the conferences that we went to, the SP is the one that we want to keep because it maintained the quality and it maintained the benefits for uh, for the industry, especially to our staff, to our mem to our members, so we do that. So because of that, for this year, we have reduced to I think uh, 15 uh, uh, ATWs uh, uh, workshops, and there are, but we still maintain about five key events. And these key conferences are OTC Asia in Kuala Lumpur in March. We have Asia Pacific Drilling Technology Conference in Singapore in August. We have Asia Pacific Hydraulic Fracturing Conference in Beijing in August as well. And Asia Pacific Oil and Gas Conference and Exhibition in Perth in October. And the International Petroleum Technology Conference, IPTC in Bangkok in November. So my plea is this. If you are given a chance to being able to be uh, participating in those conferences, make sure you use that opportunity well. Shine, you know, be, you know, show yourself and connect. Make sure that you're relevant in there as well. The time for just to be there to visit the booth is gone. Use this opportunity to actually learn, network and shine for yourself. That's important. But this is only half of it. The other half of it, we also need to develop ourselves as leaders and influencers of the industry. The fact that you have the opportunity to actually uh, be participating in those events actually give you, should actually be seen as a privilege for you. And it's actually uh, incumbent upon you to actually use that so that you can use that platform to share with others who didn't go. This will build your leadership uh, qualities as well, which will be needed for this industry as we go along. 
share it with your local, uh, what, what you found, what you discovered with your local chapters, with your local sections. So those are the kind of things that we would like people to do. This is, imagine, of when opportunities is difficult, opportunities are hard to come by, use, maximize the use of every single opportunities, not only for yourself, but also for those around you. For supervisors, whenever you can, please encourage your staff, uh, your colleagues to actually be participating, uh, take uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the volunteer to, to, to some of these uh, opportunities that is available. And for those who, are, who do not have the opportunity to be involved in many of these uh, ATW workshops or, or conferences and things like that, please don't stop there. There are opportunities that you must create in your own sections. Uh, because it's again, creating uh, the tenet of SPE is about volunteerism. It's about networking for growth together. And if you think about it, uh, I remember last year, one of the uh, SPE section actually did, you know, almost what uh, Dr. Meehan talked about, you know, environmental concern and how do we show up. They actually get, um, managed to do uh, one weekend beach cleaning. I think it's about 60 kilometers of beach cleaning or something like that. 6,000 people get involved. And this is not just a member of uh, SPE, this is a member of the public, government. And when you do that, what it does for the members is actually the ability to connect, to do network, to show volunteerism, that's a tenet of SPE, and also build your own personal leadership uh, attributes. You know, bringing 6,000 people who are not SPE members to a common cause, that's not an easy thing to do. So if one section could do, let's ask ourselves what our section could do. So this is again, that when there is no opportunity, we have to be innovative enough to create opportunities for ourselves as well as our colleagues around. This is about the time for all of us to, to kind of circle the wagon together so actually we could actually uh, grow as a, as a community. So this is what I think we should continue. And the other thing is also, why we do this virtual town hall is actually we're trying to test the ability to connect with the 12,000 in Asia Pacific, at least whomever that we can, through a different, different, uh, different uh, mode of uh, uh, what we call interaction. In the past, we will always use conferences as a mode of interaction. Now, Asia Pacific, we have the majority of our people are very young. They are so used to you know, all the WeChat, WhatsApp, all kinds of uh, social media that they could do. Whilst we use it, at least I know in Malaysia, when I look at my kids, they tend to go and exchange a photograph of birthday cakes and food and stuff like that. Could we use it, some of these, uh, what we call uh, uh, facilities, to go and create network among ourselves so that we, as an organization in Asia Pacific, can actually connect the 12,000 that we have whether you are in Myanmar, whether you are in Philippines, or you're in Malaysia and Australia, to learn and network, and not just among your, uh, uh, your local, uh, what do you call your, your local chapters and sections. So this is a plea. Please use, please figure out on how to get more innovative. And if you need support and help from many of us who are in the more senior positions in the industry, please raise it. Of course, you may not get all what you wish, but if you don't ask, you never know what you'll get. So it's a, it's a challenge with itself. And with that, I would like to thank all of you and also all the parties that make this event uh, possible today. And let's go and uh, have a Q&A session.